So today's video is all about these two 8mm movie projectors. And the video is actually a follow-up to the video I did about a Kodak and Oymig 8mm movie camera pair. These are the projectors we used with those movie cameras. And you can see there is quite a difference. This one over here, the Oymig, is from the 1950s. My dad must have bought it. And it's clearly made from some sort of cast metal housing that's been somehow surface processed and machined and really is quite a solid and really heavy piece of finely made Austrian equipment. This thing over here, the Sankyo, is a projector that we bought in the early 1970s when I was a little kid. And it was bought at the USPX in Bonn in West Germany because that's where you could get the greatest, latest stuff at really good prices. And the reason we bought it was because there's a switch up here that allows you to select between regular 8 or the original 8 millimeter movie format and the whiz bang brand new a thousand times better super 8 format and we needed that because we had gotten a brand new whiz bang super 8 camera a kodak one and well without a new projector we certainly weren't going to be able to play those movies and we really didn't want to have two projectors. And the interesting thing is, if you go on eBay now, you can see these projectors all over the place. They must have been quite ubiquitous at the time. I guess Sankyo had somehow figured out that this would be the thing to get into and must have been extremely successful because probably there were gazillions of people switching from 8mm to Super 8 and if you had an inexpensive projector that did a good job and could play both, well, you'd sell a lot of them. And I get the impression these sold way more than any of the Kodak equivalents unless you hadn't been doing movies at all and you simply bought a complete Super 8 setup um, camera and projector. So, those are my two 8mm movie projectors. And what we should do is take a bit of a look at each one of them. Here's a closer view of the Oymig projector. And you can really see what a fine piece of equipment it is. It is the P8M, presumably for movie, projector. Actually, the P8M Imperial. So it's not just a regular projector. It's an Imperial projector. Probably a bit of good 1950s marketing there. And perhaps the most notable thing about it is how mechanical it actually is. Of course, in those days, there was no such thing as microprocessors or anything. So maybe we should put a piece of film on it so you can get a sense of how it works. And the first thing to note is the film holders here are actually quite narrow, and that was typical for 8 millimeter movies. The Super 8 ones actually used a larger hole, probably so people wouldn't confuse the film. Anyway, the way you put the film in is you move the lens forward like that, and you put it around these feed cog wheels that actually have a cog wheel that's spaced to precisely fit the holes in the film. And you press this thing back like that, and it clips in hopefully nicely, like that. I think that's right. And that will now feed film at the precise rate needed to get it in front of the lens. And we'll push the lens back like that. And now we do the same thing over here at the outgoing part. You know, push this forward and hopefully it'll grab the film. I have not used this thing in probably 30 years, so we'll see if it actually works. And then you'd feed the film through. And I guess I've put my 
reel on backwards. So we'll put it on the correct way. And the reason I know it's the correct way is I see over here, there's a little slit that I can stick the film in like that. And now it's all ready. Now that just came out. Try it one more time. Yeah, and we'll just spool it up like that. And now we're ready to watch a movie. So I guess that's really what we should do. Um, I have a cord on it because it's Austrian. It actually has an Austrian plug and I have a adapter that probably was with it from the very beginning. And I'll plug it in to our power outlet over here. And let's see what happens. Well, it, it is not actually going forward. And I'm wondering why that is. So sadly, there's something wrong inside that's preventing it from going forward. This is the still and go forward um, switch. So I'm wondering if somewhere in there the mechanism to make it go forward over the years has failed in one way or the other and I'm going to have to take it apart sometime and try and fix it. But I guess that means I can't show it to you. But we can still look at a few things. This is the speed. You could set how fast the movie would go through the projector. This is backwards. This is forwards. So if you wanted to look at the movie backwards or forwards, you could do that. And you could, of course, also use that if you got the film out of the projection path, just did it reel to reel and wanted to do a rewind. And to rewind, I think there was something you could press here. And I don't immediately see it to move, yeah, there was some way you could move this up here, I believe, so that the film would be able to go from one spool to another a lot easier. What else do we have? Well, I'm going to just turn off the power like that, and that'll make it a lot easier for you to hear. Um, again, there is our on-off switch, forward-backward, lens in and out for threading the film. But perhaps what made this projector so incredible at the time was if I show you the back of it. And you'll notice there is a very elaborate mechanism on the back. And what was that for? Well, it was so that you could thread a magnetic tape from a tape recorder around this whole gizmo and most notably over this movable tape guide and then back through these two rubber rollers which would grip the tape and send it back to the tape recorder. And why was that important? Well, what it, this mechanism did was it basically allowed the speed of the tape coming from the tape recorder to adjust the speed that the film was thread through the projector. And by doing that, you could synchronize the tape to the movie. If you didn't have a mechanism like this and you tried to do that, well, inevitably after a minute or half a minute or whatever, the speed of the tape and the speed of the film would start differing just a bit and it didn't take very long for the commentary to get completely out of whack with what was on the movie. And you can actually see it. Um, there was a wonderful brochure that um, came with the projector and here it is. You can see a Nice 1950s, perfectly dressed, vintage family enjoying a movie with this projector. But more importantly, if we turn it around, what you could see is this picture where you can see the tape actually being threaded 
through the projector. And I actually tried this when I was a kid and it sort of worked. But one thing I did notice is that as this thing moved back and forth, which controlled the speed of the motor on the projector, it would start to get warm and start smelling. And that's because way before there was anything like electronic control, this was really just attached to some sort of a rheostat, a variable resistor, which would of course get hot. And who knows, maybe it would have continued to work and maybe it would have burned up. But it's really quite a fantastic um, achievement for the 1950s to actually be able to have home movies with sound. What else can I show you? Um, if we take the power cord out, there is a nice switch that you can somehow turn here. I think you have to push it in and I'm, yeah, and select different voltages for the 220, 240, and 110, 120 volt countries, as well as there's actually 160 volts on there, which is kind of surprising. I don't recall anybody using that voltage, but somebody must have at the time. And just so you can sort of get a sense of how different manufacturing was, although the plug here was clearly made with some sort of molded plastic, the connector, which plugs into the projector seems to be made out of something like bakelite and it's mechanically fastened and probably hand assembled to the cord. So that's the old projector and it actually had quite a spectacular picture. It had a 100 watt bulb. The pictures were beautiful and really it had no fault whatsoever other than it could not play Super 8 movies. So let's set this up like the other. Here's our spool of this time. It is Super 8 film and it has a much larger hole and that fits nicely onto here. And this projector actually came with its own special take-up reel and you'll notice it does not have a slot anywhere to put the film through but you probably can't see it too well, although maybe a close-up will help. There is a fine metal ring with some protrusions, and the purpose of those protrusions is to actually catch the film and automatically have it thread itself onto the spool. In fact, this whole projector was completely auto-threading. I have no idea whether this still works or not, so... Um, Let's try it once again. I will plug it in. There we go. And we'll turn on the projector. Well, that's a good sign. It's turning. And the way you did it was you pushed this thing down, I believe, and you just shoved the film in here. And the film went right through the projector and seems to be coming out the bottom. That was not the way it was supposed to work. So let's maybe reverse it and see if we do any better the next time. I don't quite know why it came out the bottom. One more go. This is what happens when you try things that haven't been used in decades. Yeah, it's, it's somehow not feeding properly, but we can fix that, I think. We should be able to just hand feed it through the bottom here. Maybe what I'll do is I will reverse it a bit, hand feed it in. There we go. We'll hand feed it in here like it should have done. Turn it on again. Ah, yes, you see, it's just, things are not just quite right anymore and it's getting stuck here now for some reason. 
see if we can force it through. I might even cut this out of the video because you don't need to see me getting frustrated. Although it might make for a more fun video. Ah, it doesn't go that way, it goes this way. It goes up and around here. There we go. Now, with a bit of luck. Ah, yes, now it's coming through. I don't know whether it'll stay that way. But let's see if it comes through enough to at least snag onto the reel. And yes, you see it did. It snagged onto the reel automatically. So back in the day, you would do that. And sure enough, if you look at my hand, well, there is an image being projected. Although you can't really see it. But there you go, it works. Much like the Oymig, you could adjust the speed. And again, if you look at my hand, I don't know if this will come through. If we get it real slow, you can actually see it flickering. Get it faster and faster. And it doesn't flicker as much. Now there's sort of a bit of aliasing occurring between the frame rate of the projector and the frame rate of my video camcorder. So you don't get a true sense of the flickering, but that is a great intro to what I wanted to show you next. And that is this, the back of the projector. Isn't that fascinating? Well, it will actually be even more fascinating when I get a screwdriver and take the back off. So bear with me for a second. First thing we'll do is we'll remove the power because if it was powered up, bad things could happen. And we'll have to see how many screws there are. I think there might have just been two. Interestingly enough, this projector made by Sanko, um, well, it's obviously no longer made, but I did some looking and Sankyo still exists. It's now called Nidec or Nidec Sankyo, and it seems to specialize in making things like little motors and various electromechanical parts and seems to be a billion dollar company. So they somehow repurposed themselves and did well. Sadly, Oymig no longer exists. And in a sense, the real Kodak no longer exists. It's been split up after going through bankruptcy and is now multiple companies that are sort of a shadow of its former self. But we can see some very interesting things in this projector. And I'm right now turning the motor by turning this fan. And what you'll notice is there is a piece of metal with some fins to block the light while the film is being advanced. And I'm just going to adjust the camera so that you can see that a bit better. I've zoomed in and changed the angle a bit. And what you can see is this fan over here and this motor um, is attached with a belt to a second axle up here. And when we turn the motor, you can see the three bladed fan shaped thing, but it's not a fan. It's a three bladed shutter. We can see it turning. And what it does is it breaks the light beam that goes to the film three times for every revolution around its axis. But the film is only advanced one frame for every revolution around the axis. And why, might you ask, would they do something like this? Because what it's doing is it's blocking the light three more times than needed. Well, the answer is to prevent flicker. And to me, this is one of the most brilliant things that occurred in the early days of motion pictures 
and even television was figuring out that while you only needed about 12 frames a second of video or film to perceive motion, at 12 frames per second, you would get quite a bit of annoying flicker. And the way to get around that was, was to show in the case of 16 or 18 frames per second, eight millimeter film, show that frame three times, even though two of the three times the frame hadn't changed. What that does though, is give you a flicker rate of three times the original rate. So getting close to somewhere around 50 frames a second, even though there were only 16 to 18 pictures per second being shown to you. And that works remarkably well. And it's actually continued on for professional formats where a 16 millimeter projector shows 24 frames a second. And in spite of that, um, you still get flicker. So a typical 16 millimeter projector has a shutter just like this, but it's usually only got two veins. So that takes the 24 frames of film and doubles it to a flicker rate of 48 showings of an image a second. And again, the flicker goes away. So that's how they got rid of flicker in movie projectors. The interesting thing is, there sort of is an analog of that in, well, analog television. You may have heard the term interlacing. And what one does in television is, instead of displaying the same image twice, which was really not easily possible for analog television, and if you tried it, it would have been a very expensive thing to do, what they do is they send two half frames of image that make up one full frame. So for North American television, a half frame of image is sent every 1 60th of a second. So what happens is you send all the odd lines in one frame, then you send all the even lines of the other frame, and that makes up a full video frame. So what you get is 60 half frames being thrown up onto your screen. So you have a flicker rate of 60 cycles or 60 Hertz. At the same time, you're only getting 30 frames of video being actually shown to you. And this was very important in those days because you had to conserve bandwidth because you couldn't do any sort of fancy digital compression the way we do today. Same sort of thing happened in Europe. There they used about 25 full frames a second made up of 50 half frames. The very interesting thing is, the, I guess it was the last time I was in Germany, which was quite a while ago, probably about 15 years ago, I was somewhere where they still had an old CRT based television. And I noticed the 50 Hertz flicker. And that brings up another interesting thing there is no exact cutoff when you can't see flicker. And it seems to turn out brighter parts of the image make the flicker more visible. So if you have a bright CRT, a bright picture, you need a higher frame rate to make the flicker invisible. And 50 Hertz is somewhere around the borderline. 60 Hertz, as we had in old analog TV in North America, you don't see the flicker at all. At least I don't, maybe some people did. And that's also why often in computer monitors from the old CRT days, you were often quite lucky if you could get one with a video card that could go up to 70 Hertz, because that really made flicker go away completely, no matter how far you cranked up the brightness. So that sort of legacy of getting rid of flicker persists today, even in all our electronic videos. 
However, it's not really that important anymore. And the reason being is that the displays we look at today, which are generally all LCD based, well, they don't flash a picture on the screen and then have it disappear and then come back and so forth. What they actually generally do is leave the pixels turned on or off until they effectively need to be switched. So flicker really isn't a problem in the same way anymore. And the only reason why we like higher picture rates, I hesitate to use frame rates because they might be half frames, but the reason why we like higher full frame rates is because you get smoother motion. That is, of course, unless you're a filmmaker and in some cases people purposely turn the frame rate down to 24 frames a second or even 18 because they want it to have that look of an old motion picture. That's the artistic bit, I guess. Anyway, that's my story of the two 8mm movie projectors, um, both very exam good examples of engineering at their times. The one thing I didn't point out, by the way, is you can clearly see how this one, while it's much lighter than the other, it's clearly made for mass production. Parts of it are made out of plastic, like the back over here, you know, just an injection molded piece of plastic. The metal in the front looks like it's stamped. Um, much, much cheaper to build. And of course, that's the way the whole world always goes in terms of manufacturing. And presumably in the 70s, way more people could have a movie projector like this than people could in the 50s when a much more labor-intensive production method was used to make a also much more finely and beautifully built piece of precision machinery. That's this video. See you next time.